Ja, meine Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, a warm welcome to this last of all the open forums in this year 2007 here in Davos. I'm very happy at this very advanced uh, hour and notwithstanding the difficult snow and transport conditions that you managed to find your way here and uh, and also a warm welcome to all of those who may be watching us on their screens at home or who are online. And very happy now to introduce uh, the panelists uh, on a subject, brands today's gods. And the question is, are brands today's gods in society and in Western society in particular? In the course of the past or recent years, there's been a dramatic development in relation to the influencing of target groups. And this shows that more and more people are switching, uh, are beginning to resist the, this bringing to bear of influence. Now, let me introduce the people on up here. Let me first of all introduce Kathleen X. She herself is a student uh, and in, at, at the International School of Geneva. She's going to be able to tell us something uh, about uh, uh, what is happening I uh, dealing with this subject of brands uh, in the schoolyard on the campus. And can I ask, is, is there a daily dramatic impact uh, in the schoolyard on who is wearing the best brands and does, uh, whether that makes the better person? Um, well, I think that... While it is true that we can see today there is an impact of brands on students in schools, I don't think that there is a dramatic effect, particularly on our campus. I, it's not quite a visible aspect of the everyday schoolyard mm -hmm. life, but it is a visible trend that you do see students wearing brands. You do see the, the purchasing and the consumption of brands, but I don't think that it's such to a dramatic effect that mm -hmm. it could be in some other... Mm -hmm. So uh, does it happen that individual uh, pupils are shut out or excluded because they can't afford to uh, wear or display particular brands? Uh, um, are there sort of differences like that which you see in your daily life? Um, again, at our school, I don't think that it's quite as visible. I think that you can see the difference between students that can afford to purchase branded goods and do wear them or do own them. But I, you can also see that there are students also that resist or either cannot afford or choose not to um, purchase brand goods. But I think, again, that there, there isn't such an exclusion or a separation or divide between the students. Mm -hmm. We invited to Reno Sam yet. Well, let's move on to Reno Sami. He'd certainly be able to give us some in-depth information. Reno Sami, you are uh, teaching art in the uh, Luzerne High School. But on this platform, you, you are rather in your capacity as a, as a prevention uh, commissioner. Um, there's this question of this debt project, and you're, uh, you're, you're helping uh, students or pupils to get out of their debt situation, or at least you're, you're advising them on this subject. So, and your, uh, uh, your undertaking is called plus minus. Can you tell us something about that? What, what about uh, these young people who can or cannot afford uh, to display brands or branded goods? What are your observations on all of this? Well, this uh, establishment, this institution in uh, Basel is a third uh, manifestation of this plus-minus uh, uh, endeavor, and this is to do with my... Uh, and there are various figures, and one of them is that in the past 10 years, uh, there's been a doubling in the, the situation, and uh, young people are, are particularly endangered. Well, in the Swiss canton, one in five young people have one in Five. The, the increase in, in, in these, these increasing figures have been ever more uh, important. 
Well, this is something that has been picked up by the media, and I'd be uh, uh, grateful if we had a really good study on this subject. Thus far, we know that there are such figures, but are not really sure what they tell us. It's important to explain to the public that uh, uh, you've started this interesting business with the school uniforms, uh, which uh, is now being taken up by a further education class. Uh, so uh, what, what actually do you expect uniforms to accomplish? And how, do, uh, how did this occur to you? Where, how did you f come upon this idea? Because it's always difficult in budgetary, uh, budgetary terms. Uh, as you know that it's a very unsexy, it's very uncool making, drawing up budgets. Nobody likes to actually do that and to work out their own budget. And so this was an attempt to uh, make a budget, to draw up budgets, which would be, uh, which would uh, give a clear indication about the spending on clothes. Um, and uh, sometimes you get very large numbers. Uh, you've got uh, young people who are unemployed, uh, who are spending 3,000 francs. And... Uh, And then the, we get this reaction from young people who find themselves under financial pressure or, or pressure from the media. Uh, what, what if we had a dress code now? Uh, let me just uh, break in there. We'd like to know a bit more about that. Uh, you've, uh, you've had, this is a very smart way of, uh, of mounting this attempt. Could I now turn to Mr. Bosshart, uh, David Bosshart. You are uh, head of the Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute, and uh, this is a think tank in Switzerland, and you're very much present in the media with all sorts of uh, intelligent comments, uh, and sometimes you, you like to be unconventional or even impertinent. Uh, perhaps one has to be when looking at the future or researching the future. Uh, your institute is an Would you actually venture to say things today which other institutions might not? Well, more important than money, perhaps, is the opportunity or the possibility to say what one really thinks is right. And that's never that easy. Because most people aren't, aren't interested in hearing the truth. They would rather hear what makes them, what reassures them. They want to hear what brings them comfort and confirms them in their views. And of course, it's great if one can ask the questions. Well, let me follow that up with another question. Are you bothered by the targeting of youth groups? Well, first of all, I'd like to ask whether this question, whether it's the right question. I'm not sure. We're really just talking about human beings and the way they behave. Uh, when people buy brands, the reason they do that is that they are they are looking to people who buy brands. They are guiding. They are guided by, or they allow themselves to be guided by people who buy the brands. Uh, and then they, you also have to look at the peer groups because that's where the. Uh, the seduction to uh, the buying of m marked uh, of brand uh, goods is, is begins. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is an open forum. Martin Sorrell is really a big fish in this subject. He's an absolute uh, head of the WPP group. He has. Uh, has, has performed very well. He's the most influential and the third largest communications and uh, network of the world. And I have read that that you have a 50 billion U.S. dollar budget. Now, this man in, has an enormous influence, and perhaps he is one of the gods that we would need to get to know. A god of uh, advertising. Would you would you accept that designation? We, we, we've got to get our facts right first. Um, <laughs> important to do that. We're not, we're not the third largest. We're the largest. 
Okay, er sagt jetzt, er so, sagt jetzt. So, die so, Quellen sagen jetzt. Well, the sources say something different. Okay, so we get that straight first. Okay, okay. Um, it, the other thing he said that really interested me. Wo würden Sie den Omnicom sehen, nur so als, als Gegenfragen? As of yesterday, we're larger than that. Okay, good. Wir lassen das mal so im Raum stehen. Okay, well, we'll just leave, we'll leave that one out there. The things you said right at the very beginning, Chairman, if I call you Chairman, was that um, the people that resisted the growth of brands, I, I don't think that's true. I don't know what data that's based on. It might be the same, same institute that gave you the data on the third largest. Yeah, different density. Um, <laughs> and what we've seen in the, in the last 5, 10, 15 years is the growth of brands, not only in what are called the developed countries of the world, but uh, increasingly in what some people call the emerging countries of the world, but which I prefer to call the fastest growth part of the world. I think we in the West uh, demean these countries, such as India or China. It's really Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, and Central and Eastern Europe, all of which uh, are currently growing faster than the country we're sitting in at the moment, uh, or most of the Western European countries uh, that are in close proximity. Uh, and the growth of brands really uh, is important in two senses. One is that we're seeing throughout the world brands grow uh, economic, as a result of economic development, which has been beneficial for many sectors uh, of the economy. And secondly, when you talk about brands, what are you really talking about? You, you see, the sort of things that you've just been talking about in the last three or four minutes, the seduction of brands the seduction of clothing in relation to school clothing is a very narrow definition of brands. I mean, is uh, Pelé, for example, the, the famous footballer uh, who is uh, somebody who kids and adults admire, is he a brand? Um, is Nelson Mandela a brand? Uh, is the Pope a brand? This, the subject of this is uh, brands as gods, I, I, I don't think brands are gods in the sense that you define them, I think, in the earlier part of this conversation. Um, but there are, it's, it's such a broad definition. I mean, mm -hmm. You represent a brand. Mm -hmm. The suit that you're wearing, the shirt that you're wearing, the tie that you're wearing, the car that you drive says something about you as a personality. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a freedom of expression. I don't think it is necessarily copying people that we see in the playground in the course of our lives. I think it's, it, it expresses our character. Now, the interesting thing is that, that many men and women uh, take great satisfaction out of not paying high prices for goods. What they take great pride in is paying low prices, going to markets, buying clothing that is shabby chic, is the, the phrase that is, that is used, I think. So, I think you have to be very careful about your definition. Was er soeben angesprochen hat, shabby chic, Shabby chic is just is precisely one of these new expressions which we do frequently hear. So that's to say things that look a bit down at heels are starting to look chic again. But you've mentioned Pele and other distinguished personalities. They are they are used as ambassadors for major brands. Uh, particularly in the world of football, this is the case. Uh, in the world championships, we saw how much money is invested in certain personalities t to buy them and then to, to, to put them to work uh, in order to be able to sell their own products. Don't you think there's a problem there? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you again. I think the answer is no. Um, Sie and, können mich auch den ganzen and, Abend and, enttäuschen. Ich habe kein <laughs> Problem damit. And the okay, you can go on disappointing me all evening if you like. <laughs> a number of systems at work, uh, but basically we're talking about a free enterprise, a free trade, capitalist system, uh, which has been extremely successful, particularly in latter years, in delivering increasing standards of life to most places on the planet. I mean, you may have seen some of the, the uh, comments from government leaders, business leaders, uh, NGOs, uh, about the state of the world economy. Uh, we are in an extremely strong position. Confidence is high. There are many challenges. Uh, but this is largely to do, I think, with the growth and development of the free enterprise system and the, the ability, the fundamental ability, 
to choose what you want to do, I think is the fundamental thing that we're talking about here. Now, if a company, uh, let's take the, the debt area that uh, was talked about. Uh, I think most responsible financial services companies would not want young people to become over-indebted, would not want families to become over-indebted, uh, and would in this day and age do everything in their power as much as they could do to make sure that not is, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. There may be disreputable companies who are focused on short-term objectives that will do that, but I don't think anybody who's trying to build a brand product or a service or a company over the long term will do that. Lassen Sie uns hier bitte nachfragen. Well, could I uh, uh, pass the question on to uh, David Bossart, first of all. It's been suggested that it isn't in the interest, interest or there's no intention on the part of individual big companies to, to, to try to load people with debt. But isn't that actually is what's hap actually happening today as the pace of uh, pr new products comes, coming on the market, prices keep being driven down, and uh, so there pe young people are buying more and more rapidly. And if you look at H&M, for example, you see, see that happening. Isn't there a strategy there? Answer, well, I would agree with Sir Martin on this. It, it is not in the primary interest of companies that people should load themselves with debt. It, it is a, a side effect, uh, which is almost inevitably follows. It's true. We're all in a free market. We're all involved in a, in a system where a person who doesn't have any money simply isn't in the system anymore. Uh, and if you want to ask what runs the world today, it is those who have money or those who control credit. Uh, that, that's one of the most important. Of course, one of the most important brands is the actual credit cards uh, that people have. And that takes us into a second link. Uh, information uh, society has become much more important. If you look at the major uh, traditional consumption goods like Coca-Cola and McDonald's, they are losing international significance, significance uh, as against new interactive media that have an entirely different significance. If you go to China or Vietnam today, the strongest markets in young people among younger people is Google and U2. And, and uh, uh, so we can see uh, changing in the markets away from the traditional markets uh, to information-based markets, information markets. Uh, and that can, that's a, can only be to the good for the whole development because the it gives the end consumer more opportunity to express themselves. So we're getting away from passive, pure consumerist markets to a much more active um, market. And I think that's positive. Brand, uh, sorry, brands, yes. Uh, these new brands, and you're talking about the digital potential. Uh, but let's look at what's going on in the real world. The increased pace of purchasing and things being cheaper. You haven't actually answered that. Is this a new strategy? Uh, I wouldn't see it quite in such emphatic terms we could see that the price war is heating up and we can see that generally speaking in entire manufacturing processes and distribution processes uh, there's a clear heating up uh, on cheap lines you think about the no frills airlines easyjet for example these are almost become cult brands and you can see a process on the social level it's, people are finding it harder and harder to position themselves. If you look at the top end of the market, you're pre luxury, super luxury, uh, premium. Uh, this is targeted on the, the wealthy individuals. Uh, everything, the, the better, finer, more beautiful brands are, are, are being pushed. Uh, and uh, in the end, those who profit... Could I just go over to Rain and Sami? You're faced with this deregulated play of forces, better, a brand, better brands, uh, getting closer to the ideal uh, customers. And can you extend on? Can you extend on that? Well, on the H and M, I think no. This, 
the, the, the basic possibility of differentiating the, the uh, this is a necessary function of the mark of the brand it's but where brands this is where brands also have a responsibility because if an advertiser or if a credit a loan institution or credit institution uh, uh, makes it possible for one uh, nonchalantly to uh, always to enjoy the the, the brand this uh, this is a false promise they can't keep their promises of the, uh, these companies and uh, and this is where we have to look critically uh, you there can't be you can't you can't promote a brand in the long term on that basis and and i think that the profits uh, that the credit institutions make in switzerland today is 14.9% uh, and you have to you can't uh, well, we can't really look at that well what that means is You can't just point the finger and say, bad boys. Uh, I also like to consume, but you have to be able to pay for what you want. If you, it, it, it's not just getting enough. You have to look back to our human values. What, what do we really want? What are our desires? And there we must do, do better in the way of prevention. We're getting an example, are we now? At the Max Money Box, you you got a hole here, and you can and you can that you have to open up the book, and you so is is this worth a fifteen kilos of of a veal or? Lots of people want, wanted this forum, and I think that they can think what needs to be promoted. Or is it the comp to, to reflect on the competence of young people themselves? So, so Martin Sorrell, is there a development in consumer thinking, in distribution and sales thinking in the modern industrial society, uh, in this uh, service-based society? Is there a need for more responsibility when we've just heard what's been said, is there a new culture? Or is it just a question of trying to sell as much product into the shortest possible time? Well, I'm, I'm a little confused by some of the things that have been said. Maybe it's the translation. But H&M um, um, and Zara, for example, uh, have produced very high quality, very well designed, mainly female merchandise at very low prices uh, and have opened up fashion and fashionable goods to a broader section of the population. So these are not high-priced brands, right? Um, I think some talk was mentioned about Coca-Cola and McDonald's being under pressure and relationships to Google and YouTube. We're confusing things. Now, if you look at information technology, Google, which we believe is the, the we will be issuing a, a report on brands shortly, the end of February with the Financial Times, uh, and Google will be the most valuable brand in the world. Last year it was Microsoft. But these are brands in information technology and what's happening is uh, y young people are reading newspapers less. They're consuming media through digital means. You can't confuse Google and YouTube with Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Look at Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Look what ha what's happened to them over the last few years. As uh, Coca-Cola has come under pressure because of uh, child obesity, a pandemic such as diabetes, uh, McDonald's, a uh, similar position. They have altered the constituent ingredients of their brands. They've developed new products that appeal more to modern living and more healthy living. And McDonald's is a good example of a company, and Coca-Cola is going through the same uh, change. Examples of companies that are changing the way they do things in reaction to consumer habits. The other thing you said was, you know, that it's, paying, it's buying more uh, for less. Uh, one of the functions of brands is to build volumes 
to enable consumers to buy things for less money. If you manage to sell in greater volumes, unit costs come down. Advertising plays a quite valuable role in stimulating consumption to bring those unit prices down. So I think there's a lot of things that I heard in the panel contradictory, uh, contradictory things. In, in relation to what you just said in terms of is there new distribution means, uh, I think if you look at these faster growing markets that I mentioned before, particularly China and India, where we have in China 1.3 to 1.5 billion people, in India 1.1 billion people, uh, both those countries uh, are, are growing in one in a what I would call um, a more democratic system, uh, and the other, China, I would call it state-directed capitalism. Uh, both countries are growing at a prodigious rate and wealth is trickling down uh, at a fairly rapid rate and at a rate where we will see those countries eclipse and it will be a very uncomfortable process for us in the West. We will eclipse the growth of the, world, of the West and the status that the West has had. Uh, this is nothing new. If you went back to the 19th century, you would see that India and China accounted for about 40% of the worldwide GNP, which they will account for again, according to uh, sources such as Goldman Sachs, uh, in 2040 or maybe even sooner, 2025. Mm. So it's, back, it's back to the future. So I think when you think about brands, they bring a lot of benefits. Again, I object, I resent to somewhat the description and the agenda of them being gods, but they bring a lot of benefits to the consumer population uh, and to, to groups within the population. Excesses should be avoided. You know, excess debt, excess consumption. Companies should act responsibly, but it's a tremendous amount of benefit. Mm -hmm. In what you have just said, you mentioned Coca-Cola and McDonald's as two brands, and you have said that they are actually in quite a difficult situation because there's been resistance on the consumer markets to these brands. Now, how did this develop, this resistance? What are the reasons, and what's going to happen in the future? Does it mean that people think these brands aren't any good? Yeah. You, can, you can have two systems. You, know, you can set yourself up as the regulator, as the government that decides what is good for people, or basically, that's on one end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, a state-directed system. Uh, and we've seen that try to operate on both political wings, right and left mm -hmm. historically, and both have uh, failed, in most cases, quite miserably. Or you can have people operate in a free and democratic <laughs> way. They can make the choice. Now, if obesity is an issue, which it is, if diabetes is an issue, which it is, if it is a pandemic, consumers will be more concerned about what food they eat and how they eat it and what physical exercise they take and how go they go about their lives. That is happening at the moment. So in the cases that you just mentioned, Coca-Cola and McDonald's, they have altered their brands. They have ordered, altered the constituents and ingredients of those brands to fit what consumers want. Consumers are making a choice. Water becomes more popular. Yogurts become more popular because they're, they're more healthy. Salads. In the UK, we've not debated school uniforms as you are in Switzerland. We debated school dinners. Mm. And, and, and what the health ministries and what the government are doing are trying to stimulate private companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and well-known chefs have taken a similar position to get kids to eat much more healthy food. Good. Lassen Sie mich mit diesen out. Well, let me turn to Kathleen, having heard these answers. Sir Martin Sorel has touched upon two possibilities. On the one hand, one could intervene and regulate through the government to end this war between brands, or one lets the citizens take the decisions independently. What would you prefer? Well, I think that when we're looking at brands and the competition and intervention, I think that when there's a healthy competition between brands that gives um, a consumer choice and opportunity, then that can be very beneficial. But when looking at, for example, the examples with obesity and diabetes and all these problems that have arisen from brands and issues from the products that they're selling, I mean, I think that we also have to look at the responsibilities of the companies. Was it not a fundamental responsibility of, say, Coca-Cola and McDonald's to know the risks that their products can have and to 
responsibly market their products rather than wait for a problem to happen and then conform to the consumer's desires. And I think that's, that's one of the problems that we're looking at today is we see there are so many beneficial aspects of brands to the economy and to society, but at the same time, there, there are many problems that have to deal with health um, individuality, and so many different yeah. aspects to Aber ich will Sie noch mal fragen. Well, I'm asking you directly, would you prefer the state or the government to intervene and to impose certain rules, this, that and the other had to be done or would not be allowed because of the danger to health? Or from your point of view, since you are young, are you in favor of the free play of markets? and I will simply not consume this any longer because it's not healthy for me. What are you in favor of? There is an aspect which the government does need to play. It does need to regulate how much um, competition, how much information can be given to the consumers, but I think at the same time that as taking youth, for example, it is our responsibility to, in a certain aspect, to get as much information as we can on a product that we want to buy, on a brand, and make a responsible choice when we're consuming or purchasing a product. So I think that there needs to be a balance between the two at the same time, because if there is an excess of competition, excess of brands, excess of everything that um, makes the consumer society what it is, then that can be solved. Part of it can be solved by governmental um, processes, but at the same time there is a, a responsibility of consumers to pay attention, decide, make a choice what they want and then responsibly consume that product. Mm -hmm. Reno Sami. Reno Sami. In a survey of a thousand adolescents, more than 700 answered that they would buy even if they were going to have to be in debt. And only about 240, that's to say about a fourth of those interviewed said, no, I will stop purchasing if I see that I become indebted. So is, that, is there a potential there? Is there room to, to learn that the younger people will be able to learn properly how to act sensibly? Yes, let me say two things regarding the value of the brands in particular. As I said, I'm not against brands. They have their value. But often brands do indicate or suggest that being is determined by appearance about owning by property. Adolescents are in a time of their life where they are questioning social order, they are following their peer group, that is what guides them. Now, even if they are guided by the leaders and buy more and spend more, obviously you have to talk about debt and different levels of debt and you'd have to have a scientific discussion of that. But if they spend more money than they actually have in order to acquire something, then they are not being very clever. It's not smart to do that. It's not smart to spend the money that you don't have. That's one point. Secondly, if people feel or the young feel that their self-value is determined by their parents, then they're making a mistake. They have to find strength in themselves. And that is where we have a duty, and that may be the duty of the brands as well, to do something to strengthen the self-worth of young people, of adolescents. And there is where we have to make it possible for young people to test things, try out things, experiment. They need to have the possibility of talking about money, emotions, the moderator. Yes, but very often the young have more of this kind of buying impulses and that they are much more tempted to buy without reflecting on what they are doing. So they don't really reflect, they don't think. It's a spontaneous buying. Yes, indeed. They see something, they want it, and they get it. It's instant gratification. 
It is an addictive element. It's got something to do with this addictive shopping. So you cannot do prevention which is totally isolated from the product that is addictive. The brands can provide what they want. If you had people who were sensible in terms of their consumer habits, then they can also decide what they really need or not. But when you leave adolescents all on their own at a time when they're still developing, but I must say that uh, even as an adult, I find it difficult for myself to decide what I really need or what I just want because I like it and I think I need it because it will make me happy. So I have problems with that myself. David Bossart. Would you like to add something here? All these rituals, the shopping rituals, have changed dramatically. In the past, it took much longer until someone actually bought something. These times have shortened considerably. Could you say something about that? Yes, the discussion has been deflected. We are not talking about brands, but we're talking about something that only marginally are connected with brands. It has been proven that a strong brand cannot be resisted. A strong brand consists of two uh, unseen elements. It's a myth. It's a story that is retold and retold, and it's contemporary philosophy. There are only very few strong brands. We're not talking about Knorr or Maggi or things like that, but we're talking about cult brands. What are these cult brands? I'll tell you in a moment. The commonplace brands are just trying to survive in a fierce price competition. They're trying to not become cheaper, but there are brands like iPod, which is a cult. You can't do anything against it. The wish is so strong to get this product. No regulatory possibilities will be able to stem this, but there are only a few products or brands that are really that strong, and a strong brand distinguishes itself by being able to maintain this characteristic of being a cultus for such a long time. I just mentioned iPod because everyone knows, knows it. It's a very strong brand. It is very popular with young people at the beginning of 2000 and 2001, 2003. It dropped a little bit, but it has gained strength again. In the case of McDonald's, even though there are ups and downs, the McDonald's is still in the heart and the mind of people. And if you look at young people, there are only just a few brands. Which are international or global that actually trigger off this coveting. So, Martin Sorrell, you seem to have been shaking your head when listening to your neighbor. What would you say? You know, the example of iPod to be um, quite extraordinary. I mean, re recorded music, uh, which older people, middle-aged people, younger people enjoy, used to cost far more uh, in records and CDs uh, than they do in iPods. Uh, you can download music onto your iPod and have it conveniently available at any point in time in a far more efficient and effective way than you ever could do with records, 5s or 78s, 33 and a thirds, or, or CDs. And that is development. You mentioned actually EasyJet a, a moment ago. Now, the, the environmental issue is a, is a serious issue and a very important issue, which Davos 2007 has concentrated on. But what has EasyJet done? EasyJet has reduced the cost of air travel to a degree where many people who could not afford to, pl sure. to fly, and, we, and flying was the privilege of the rich, and that has spread. Now, that has caused environmental issues, which we're having to address, address and responsible corporations are increasingly dealing with it. You mentioned uh, another area. You mentioned Knorr, for example, a, a well-established, strong brand owned by young people, a, a global brand. Now, uh, certainly if Canor and, and its constituent brands are overpriced, we've seen over the years the development of retail brands. Egro, sure. Caravan, More than ever. More Tesco, than ever. Walmart. What have those companies done? They have uh, um, made available goods at far lower prices, Walmart being a classic example, 
Tesco being a classic example, far lower prices uh, than ever consumers were able to buy those goods before. So you're, you're getting uh, an improvement in technology and process. And what has driven the world economy, when you look at it over the last 10, 15, 20 years, is two things. One is free trade, lack of restriction. And the secondly has been the growth of technology. And I know we, we in families, I mean, if, if, if adolescents uh, are, are being excessive, excessive expenditure, it's not only the government that should be responsible, but the family unit should be responsible. A lot of adults, by the way, have difficulty in controlling their budgets too. Uh, and the responsibility is not just that of the state, if you're going to make that uh -huh. argument. The responsibility is of the family to make sure that it's done as well. So, lassen Sie uns dieses Thema gleich auf. Let's, let's pick up on that right away. So, Martin Soli, we were touching upon the family, the family unit. That is certainly a subject we need to discuss. The pressure on adolescents of buying more obviously has a direct effect on the family as well. Renosami, since they then have to reschedule their debt and refinance uh, to make sure that their kids don't get into great difficulties. So this is the responsibility of the family, which may have to change in future and be different from what we have today. Yes, so Martin Sorrell said quite rightly that it's not just a problem that adolescents have. Even adults um, tend to spend too much. It's a basic problem. How do we actually deal and cope with this issue of money and uh, indebtedness? Do we say, do we have a double standard? We say that uh, debts, having debts is bad, but consuming is good, and you can consume as much as you like. We don't really have any philosophical stand on this. Now, it's not just the family that is in question. It's also the economy. Yes, but let's stay with the family, says the moderator. What is the role of the family? Because you also have experience with families, the children, the adolescents, and then the whole family unit that has to deal with this. What is the role of the family then today? Yes, many parents buy the stuff the kids want. That's natural because sometimes I would like to buy for my daughter what she would like to have, perhaps without laying down any restrictions. These are problems that can exist, and too little is being done in Switzerland. We have 40 offices for debt counseling, and that's not enough in Switzerland. You cannot leave all the responsibility on the shoulders of the families. Obviously, families have to take on some responsibility. Think tanks like uh, the GDI should intervene or help develop something. More should be done not just uh, apportioning blame, that's not enough. David Bossard, you said exactly that earlier on. That is to say, if you cannot find your own food nowadays, well, then you're in a problem in today's society. So the parents have to buy or have to pay for what the children have bought if they buy beyond their own means. And what then should the family unit do in such a case? Most of the time, children are not under observation. They don't have any structures. Their, their day is not structured. Many studies have shown this. That is where children are most endangered, when for the whole day they never get a proper meal, neither breakfast, lunch, nor dinner. They don't spend time regularly with their parents to discuss all sorts of things with them. That is the category of children that is most endangered. Or families where there are one, two, three television sets, they are also most at risk. Where there's no possibility to have an exchange of views. Those who still live in a structured family, have a structured day, are less at risk. Well, families are under more pressure today than they used to be. The parents work and the children have to spend more time at school, have more homework. 
there's much more pressure, and that has led to a difference in attitude and mentality and behavior. I think what we need to do is give individuals more structured time. There's a need for stimulus, for incentive to entertain themselves. What about the future? Do you have any kind of models, any possibilities, any solutions in mind? Yes, let me bring it back to the level of the brands. The stronger brands that are being generated nowadays are the celebrity brands. These are people that are examples of authority, and we follow these celebrities, we copy them, we emulate them, so that we try and do what these celebrities are doing because we don't have any family structure anymore. Uh, Catherine, Mr. Bossett was speaking about families and the family unit. What kind of experience have you had with your own family? Have you had the possibility of discussing these things uh, with your parents and having exchange of views with them? Um, well, from personal experience, speaking about consumption and the influence within the family unit, I think that um, in my own family, I don't, I think, well, for me, I don't feel a pressure to consume a certain type of good. I don't feel the need to possess certain brands. And I think that comes from, I mean, in every family, I think the consumption patterns of the family and of the children, I think, comes from the way you're brought up. Mm -hmm. And also, as well as the financial issues within the family. Aber haben Diskussionen but did, did, did you have discussions with your parents about budget and so on? I, I don't think it's not a prominent issue within my own personal, within my own family of discuss, I mean, discussing that. We don't tend to have, we don't focus on that part einfach, of our life. Yeah, einfach weil sie genügend Geld. Just because you had enough money or, or why didn't you have such discussions? I feel that I'm quite well off and so... We do, obviously we do talk about finances within our family, but um, personally I earn money, I, I earn my own money, but I also receive money from my parents, and I think that they take financial issues very seriously, and I think that I've been brought up very well learning about how to deal, how mm -hmm. to um, deal with money and finances and mm -hmm. how, how to work and be responsible with that, mm -hmm. and so I think that, that, I mean, that's something that I really hope that um, a lot of families can try and incorporate in, mm -hmm. in the future. I think that's something that needs to be more um, important. Mm -hmm. Reno Sami. Reno Sami, you also mentioned something earlier on. Catherine has a job or jobs to, to earn money, to be able to buy things and to go on studying. Do you think that's a good solution? To, to discover the wealth of money on one's own. Yes, this brings us to this discussion of budgetary, budget planning. No, but it was a good example that Catherine gave. I think every family has its own model. I think it's a pity that you did not talk about budgeting in your family. I don't think that, it, I think it's necessary that every family should talk about money. Very often it's a taboo. A taboo. Parents usually don't want to tell their children how much they earn, how much rent they pay, and they, how much the children cost. I think it's fine when children or adolescents earn money, have a job, Usually there's also pocket money. I think there is no fast and hard rule about this. But it would be good to have a budget. In my family, we have four accounts. We have the household account. We spend 800 francs for a household of four people on food and household expenditure. Then we have an uh, account for insurances and account for children and account for um, provisions and holidays and car. This is a way in which you could handle your finances. I'd like to turn to Sir Martin. You are seen as a financial genius. That is what 
And this is how you are praised in the financial journals, one of the cleverest and smartest. That's certainly no good. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but but uh, some people also say of him that he knows no limits in financial terms. So do you understand what has been said? What kind of recipes would you give us on family budgeting? Is this also a, an interesting subject for you? Uh, 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 we, we're, we're, we're religious in, in budgeting, as anybody inside our company will tell you, uh, each year, and, uh, each month, month and each quarter. But um, I think that's wholly um, an advantage and, uh, and virtuous. But, you know, to listen to some of the comments, uh, you know, I would think that here we are in 2007 and life has got worse and worse and worse. You know, are we better off, certainly materially, we can talk about spiritually and from a religious point of view, but are we or are we not better off in 2007 than we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago? And I visit Switzerland fairly often, and my sense is that the Swiss are better off today than they were 15 or 20 years ago. To listen to some of the speakers, you would think that was not so, that their life is pressured, uh, that they're always uh, over budget, uh, that families are falling apart, that adolescents don't know what they're doing, they have unstructured lives, they don't eat. Uh, it, it sounds a terrible life. Um, I, I, I'm, struck, I'm struck by this because I remember Peter Brabeck, who I think is the uh, chairman and CEO of Nestle and has participated uh, in these sessions before. Last year at Davos, gave some very interesting statistics. Uh, at the opening part of the conference. Uh, and he quoted statistics. Uh, this was a survey that was done around the world uh, on whether parents thought teaching their children to work hard was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and he quoted two examples, uh, two countries. Denmark, where 2% of the families surveyed, parents surveyed, thought it was important and virtuous to teach children, their children to work hard. Whereas in China, 98% of the families thought that this was the case. This is the fundamental issue in some of the comments. We're straying a long way, I think, away from brands. But you, we can choose, you know, the French 35-hour week, which was somewhat controversial. We can choose to do that. The French can choose to do that. But you have to understand the implications of it. And the implications are that standards of living and productivity will decline as a result. Now, maybe we want to have happier lives. And maybe that's something that we all want, we all need, and we should have. But in a competitive world, we have to realize the implications of it. That's one point. Second point is this. Again, at Davos this year, 2007, there's been tremendous focus on corporate social responsibility or corporate responsibility, principally global warming, environmental issues, health issues. We had a session on sport and the role that sport can make in a constructive way, these celebrities that uh, are meant to be so terrible, that the celebrities could communicate with children and with parents the virtues of a healthy life, of regularly exercising and all the attendant values. These issues are issues that corporations are taking more and more seriously. And I think there have been three seminal events, very important events in the last year, which have demonstrated the power of, of the change in thinking. The first was when Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, a major financier, who many of you may have heard of, decided that they would engage in a major act of philanthropy involving Microsoft stock and Berkshire Hathaway stock. And they've, they've put together a major program of giving uh, to deal with major causes. That was one. The second was when Richard Branson, who is another one of these easy jet in this case, virgin type of entrepreneurs, who has made lower cost tra travel available to the masses, agreed that he would put up to three billion pounds, so about five billion dollars, uh, into good causes over the coming years. And the, and the final uh, seminal act, I think, was when James Murdoch, the son of Rupert Murdoch of uh, News Corp fame, and Rupert Murdoch himself, decided that they would make sure that their corporations, B Sky B, and News Corp would be carbon neutral. Now, these are three big examples, and if you were part of the Davos conference over the last few days, 
bit, three or four days. The, the interesting point was that no CEO, I think, of any company would deny the importance of dealing with environmental issues, social issues, NGO issues, in the, if they want to build their businesses, their products and services in the long term. Good, this, yes, well, this, yeah, yeah. Sorry, just one thing. This is the crucial issue. Consumers will increasingly decide to buy brands, to differentiate brands and choose brands on the basis of the contribution that those corporations, those products and those brands make to society. Good, here sind wir jetzt an einem sehr... Well, this has brought us to a very interesting point, and I would like to turn the discussion over to you, ladies and gentlemen. Will brands be bought in the future because they can demonstrate that they are doing something for the environment, that they are exercising social responsibility? Now, who may I give the floor to first uh, with a question to the panelists? Please briefly uh, raise your hand so that we can see you. Down here on the left, there's somebody. Could you please take a microphone to them? Uh, Could you briefly introduce yourself? Ian Lemma, and I'm yeah. a student from Geneva. And earlier in the discussion, Mr. Sorrell pointed um, out. Um, sorry. Okay. Well, pretty much you mentioned that a phrase that. Sorry. Um, most people use brands as a way to express themselves. Well, my question is that is the people who, bought, who are bought into brands, are they, do you see them as a person, an, as an individual, or do you just see the brand? If I understand the question correctly, I mean, I think when people buy certain brands, um, they are expressing themselves. The brand has certain tangible attributes. They may be technological attributes, and they have certain psychological attributes. Uh, brands, the brands you choose, the, the car you drive, where you live, where you take your holiday, the books you, you read, the, the technology you use, whether it be an iPod or Blackberry, or whatever it is, say something about you in a tangible way uh, and an intangible way. And I think there's nothing immoral in buying brands for psychological, emotional, or lifestyle reasons. Um, some people in our industry talk about uh, consumers loving brands and having relationships with them. And the strongest brands are the brands that you have relationships with. It can be a newspaper that you trust. And as, as Google and Yahoo and eBay and Amazon become more important and technology becomes more important, those brands that you trust, those newspaper brands, or the BBC, or NBC, or whatever it happens to be, the network television, as they go online, you will trust those brands. That's an emotional connection, in a way. So that's what I was trying to, trying to get at. And, and celebrities, uh, the, you know, companies, use, companies don't use celebrities that have bad values. In fact, they jettison celebrities that get into bad habits fairly quickly. And what they want to do is, when they use a celebrity, is break through the clutter of advertising and marketing spending. But they're trying to find a celebrity that will express the virtu virtuous values, not immoral or amoral values. Mm -hmm. Vielen Dank. Many okay. thanks. So what, um, what you were saying is that when someone may buy a brand, yes, they may be expressing their individuality, but I think that a lot of the time, a large percentage of people that do buy brands are buying, are following a trend. And so I think that one of the problems that we see with branding in society today is um, when I think that a lot of the time you see some, if you, anywhere you walk around and you look around, if you see someone, I think a lot of the time if they're wearing a brand and you see the brand logo before you actually see the person, I think that if they're, um, if they have a branded product, I think that, that really, they may be trying to express themselves in an individual way, but I think that that also can take apart from their identity themselves, and I think that that's one of the issues that a lot of people have with branding, is that while, while you may say that it could be an individual expression of your own personality, it's mm -hmm. at the same creating... Um, you're, a lot of people become uniform, they become the same because they're all following the same but, brand. But, but, you know, we see in technology, 
we are creating communities. I mean, are you on MySpace or YouTube, or Second Life or Small World, any of those? Um, occasionally. Okay. But, but you're doing that to build a relationship with your peers, with people you like, compare notes on what you like, what you dislike, where you've been maybe traveling, holidays you've taken, family issues, opportunities. I mean, we build communities and we, we associate with people that we like and admire and respect. I don't think there's anything uh, wrong in that. Mm -hmm. Is this ganz einfach? It's quite simple to generalize this. You're looking for the tribe. You're looking for the tribe which some, something you can belong to. Well, today we've got a change in the whole way we live, we communicate, we do marketing. What has happened in the last 20 or 30 years, and Sir Martin is a brilliant advertiser, let's not forget this, in the last 20 or 30 years that, that it is television uh, that, uh, that, that has uh, put brands uh, in the forefront. And now we've got these new media, we've got uh, YouTube, uh, Google, and all these uh, new IT media. These are interactive. And anybody who wants to build market share in the future is going to have to bring people in, going to involve people in the process. That's to say, as between the, the manufacturer and the market creators and the consumer, there is going to be an interactive network. And that is going to dramatically change the way advertising is done. It's no accident if you look at the history uh, and look at the CEOs and the presidents. Uh, it's always the, the winners who write the history. And uh, the advertisers face the challenge that, uh, they, of course, they must always sell what is beautiful and what is positive. In, in the past, they, they were able to or they tried to. They tried to get rid of the negative, but now, now they're facing corporate social responsibility. Now they have to deal with the environment. Now all of the social issues that are crowding into this, and this is going to dramatically change the whole picture. And so this is going to raise communication to a new level. Well, a, a follow-on question from that. You've talked about the new potential uh, from everything that could be called communication, but is it going to lead to greater co-determination or sharing in decision-making by consumers? Are they going to influence uh, products and brands? Well, yes, uh, I'm not sure whether co-determination is the right word. Uh, when people look at communication trends, the, all the wisdom of the crowd, all the opportunities they have to influence certain trends I think things can move much more rapidly now, as well as dying away more rapidly as well. But be, be, all, all, be, the, be it as it may, all brands have to grapple with these issues much more than they've had to in the past. And as concerns market distribution, this is simply going to change in the next few years. Uh, it's not possible for brands to simply uh, to, to, to rule the roost the way they have in the past. Uh, could I... Ask now, how is this going to influence, influence the world of products that consumers, without delay, can almost immediately react to the products and the brands? How is that going to affect things? I think uh, the technology that you're referring to is a wonderful opera, uh, opportunity. Absolutely. I, I, so we agreed on that. Sure. And, uh, and, uh, I hope you always I, got I, the translation I, I, correctly. I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I think there may be a little bit of it. Um, but I got myself into terrible trouble a few weeks ago by saying that... Uh, that the new technologies, the internet and mobile technologies, for example, were, the best, were, were tremendous examples of the socialization or communization, com communist uh, influences. Uh, and I was nearly blogged to death as a result. So I, I, I modified <laughs> it to democratization. And well, what we're witnessing now are the power that the consumer has, that you in this room, that I and everybody else has, in terms of dealing with institutions that we couldn't exercise ever before. I mean, let me just give you an example. Uh, one, of our, one of our companies created uh, a real beauty campaign for Dove Soap, for Unilever, uh, and uh, produced the commercial uh, on the web for, uh, for about $50,000, uh, Canadian dollars, uh, called Evolution, uh, which has had millions of hits at very low cost uh, and has been, become a cult, a cult operation. 
consumers now for the Super Bowl uh, in, in, in America, which is the, the biggest sporting event and where uh, commercial time costs uh, the, the biggest thing, about two and a half million dollars for 30 seconds. Uh, the company is engaging with the consumers and consumers are making commercials that will be aired, will be chosen and aired on the question. I was talking mm -hmm. to, to a journalist who runs um, um, films, uh, documentary films on PBS, the public broadcasting system uh, in America. Uh, consumers are using cheap video technology, the sort of things that you see on YouTube, to produce three-minute documentaries that are aired on P PBS that are of the same quality as professional documentaries that are done. Mm, that's what, we're, what we're seeing is tremendous opportunities for consumers, for you and I, to exercise our democratic rights. In, in Korea, there was the growth of a newspaper, an on online newspaper called Oh My News, which is a citizen's newspaper. Citizens provide all the copy, all the stories, and that online newspaper, which has millions of hits a day, has actually provided the major scoops and stories in South Korea over the last year or so. Now, is, haben wir jetzt einige gute well, we've heard some good examples now how these interactions uh, are going to be shaped in the future. Uh, let's have another question now. Who is going to be the next speaker? Over there, please. Could you stand up briefly so that uh, so that they, they can, the, the chap with the microphone can see where you are. Sir Martin Sorrell. Uh, just the other day I was thinking of, my family and I were thinking of buying a car. So we sat down at the breakfast table and I was talking to my wife about buying a car. My four-year-old steps in and says, you must buy a Honda. You definitely must buy a Honda. I said, where did you find this, where do you come up with this conclusion? You must buy a Honda. She said, well, Daddy, I, I just switched on the TV, and it was on children's TV. And my question to you is, adult products like Honda, why are they advertising, branding, targeting, adult brands targeted towards children on children's television? Isn't this an extension of pester power? Is this ethical? Well, uh, we don't do the Honda budget. So it sounds, it's, it sounds to me as if it's sort of a bad case of media planning. Because um, clearly if, if the target should have been you yourself. Uh, I mean, there are examples and we've seen restrictions introduced in more relevant categories, in the food category. For example, in the UK now, there's been voluntary acceptance, or there has been acceptance of regulation in terms of advertising to children, and there can be excesses. I think responsible corporations, and I have to emphasize, corporations that are in business for the long term um, are exercise their, that responsibility in terms of what they do. On the, on the basis, just, just go back to your example of cars. Um, under the new technology, the, the statistics show that in America now, 70 to 80 percent of all car purchases are made using internet technology or on the web. That never used to be the case. And what has resulted in is more efficient pricing, lower prices, more efficient purchasing decisions. And I don't think you can criticize generally in the case of, uh, let's say, car buying in America now, that the consumer is better informed than he or she has ever been. You know, the, the tyranny of geography used to operate you could, you know, if I wanted to, to stay in a hotel room 10 or 15 years ago in Zurich, or here, even here in Davos, I wouldn't know what the competitive pricing was. Today, I can Google or Yahoo or search competitive pricing uh, of similar products and get recommendations as to what will be the most effective. It's the, the system is more efficient and more effective than it's ever been. Well, what does my four-year-old know about cars? Well, I, I don't that, know what programs. A, I don't know. What, adult, well, I, why are these adult products on? I don't know what programs your, your your child watches. I'm not aware that you see heavy car advertising in children's programming. Maybe your four-year-old was looking at a news program uh, later on in the evening, seven or eight o'clock in the evening. You know, the the issue. Uh, I'll give you an amusing example. An amusing example. There, there was a child aged 
three years old in the UK who ordered, this is the, an example of the impact of technology on younger people, who ordered a car on eBay for £9,000 without, <laughs> without his parents knowing because he found, found the code and inputted the code at three years old into the computer. The moral of this story is don't underestimate the intelligence of your kids with new technology. Good, it's given the next question. Okay, the next question, please, on this side, this time. Could you please stand up so that you can be recognized? Merci. My name is Dietma, and I'm working at Design to Context, the Institute for Design Research in uh, Zurich, a school of art in design, and I'm a brand consultant. Um, and actually now uh, busy with a, a program on um, or questioning, so to say, the culture of brands and also uh, questioning with the uh, international uh, group of designers what, um, so to say, the, the producers, the, the developers and the creative industries can do in this, exactly in this issue. Um, I see uh, a big um, responsibility of, for instance, designers and creative people uh, they are in the position to, they are on, on the source where, so to say, communication is being developed. And so I have a, a question to uh, Sir Martin Sorel. Um, what do you think um, creatives can do to, so to say, propose um, different images of mankind, uh, different images of um, life possibilities, mm -hmm. instead of, so to say, the marketing-oriented communication strategy-based uh, lifestyle, which is, so to say, kind of uh, uh, narrow-minding. Um, I, I understand, so to say, the, the free option. Yeah. Thank, you for this interesting... Thank you for that interesting question. We'll, well, let's give uh, him an opportunity to reply now. Sie angesprochen. He was, he was asking you. Um, no, I, I think I touched on it a little bit before, and it's been touched on by the other speakers. Uh, that there, are, there is a growth of, let's call them ethical brands, or uh, more uh, community responsible or environmentally responsible brands. You know, we've seen in the energy industry um, that historically uh, some oil companies believed that all you had to do was to get the oil out of the ground at the lowest possible price. Uh, more latterly, more recently, some of those energy and oil companies have realized their uh, social and environmental responsibilities uh, and have realized it has to be done in an environmentally acceptable way. Again, in Davos 2007, I think we've seen, I think for the first time, very serious undertakings being made uh, and an understanding by CEOs, going back to your point, I, don't, I, I think that the creative community can aid the process, but I think leadership now inside corporations fully understands their moral responsibilities and their ethical responses in this area, I would say probably almost universally for the first time. I don't think any CEO of any responsible corporation can, can now get up on a public platform and make statements that ignore the significance and importance of the environment or the social implications of what they do. I think that's gone. Uh, the, the Al Gore film, some people might have criticized it in one way or another, on the environment, I think, again, is another sort of seminal example of a change, stimulating a change in thinking. Mm. A very uncomfortable truth. Indeed, any questions from the audience regarding family and family responsibility? Maybe putting the same kind of questions to the other panelists, a young gentleman in the second row. Uh, so I'm a student at the International School of Geneva. And I have a little story, which I think will help explain the comparison mm -hmm. in the title of this forum. Short story? Uh, it's, yeah, it's okay. pretty short. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the former manager of the advertisement for uh, the Dove company, I had to convince the board uh, to accept her new advertising campaign with more normal women in advertisements. And so what she did, she surveyed the board members' daughters and found that they were all depressed after they read magazines like, I don't know, Vanity Fair or magazines which 
are full of advertisements with brands. And so obviously there is pressure created from these advertisements and from brands. And um, my concern is that it's creating unnecessary pressure in developed countries where we should be comfortable and we should be not worrying about stupid things like what our clothes look like. And we should be concerned with being generous and helping other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. David Bossart, would you say this question? David Bossart, what would you say to that? What's the, what's the essence of the question? I didn't understand what you were trying to say. What was the question? And focus your question because Mr. David Bossart didn't well, get the real point of your question. Just a short point of what you mean. Well, my question is more directed at Mr. Sorrell because uh, he seems to deny that there is pressure created from the advertisement of brands. And I think this is proof that there is pressure. And But the, the Dove example was the one that I mentioned before, the evolution film. Uh, and the, the real beauty campaign was based on precisely what you're talking about, was that was to try and deal with the peer pressure. Uh, what it said was, you know, there are, you know, they're not all uh, fashion models uh, around, and it was appealing to real women, website, etc., precisely to deal with the issue that you're talking about. And I think this shows the power of the marketplace, yeah. is that if a product or a service offends sensibilities environmentally, uh, or from a health point of view, or in this case from a beauty point of view, I think the market responds. You know, the, the great thing about the marketplace is, is if you get it wrong, you get punished. David Ogilvy, who was the founder of one of our companies, uh, and it's not a politically correct statement anymore, said many years ago, the consumer is not a moron, he, she's your wife. Now, you would, you would amend it today to be, the consumer is not a, a moron, uh, her, his or her partner is, is the consumer. And... If you make a mistake, you get punished. Consumers are not stupid. But the problem is this is just one isolated case. And it's really not a growing not, trend. No, no, it's not for... an isolated case because if you, are, if, you, if you don't produce benefits, they can be tangible benefits or intangible benefits, you're punished. Now, you can, you can, you can create imperfections in the marketplace through regulation, but by and large what we've seen over the last, like it or not, Some people who have political views don't like it, certain political views don't like it, but like or not, the free market system has worked very effectively. And if you look at what is happening in the faster growing markets of the world, they are, most of them are embracing the free market system to see that it gets done. Any imperfection, you get punished. Particularly, by the way, in an economy in the world over the last 10 or 15 years, that from an inflation point of view, we've had very low inflation, And we've had very little pricing power for corporations. Their ability to increase prices in a low inflationary environment is, much, is very prescribed, and the competitive environment has been very intense. Most industries, you have overcapacity. Mm. You can produce, for example, the car industry. They can produce, eight, going back to the hundreds, of it, they can produce 80 million units. Consumers in the world can consume 60 million units. There is pressure on the manufacturers mm -hmm. because of overcapacity, which is exacerbated by concentration in retail. Uh, Sie mich, Sir. Yeah. Would I like, could I comment on that? It's, it's, it's right, what he, is correct what he's saying, but only in part. The markets self-adjust, and let's not forget the power of the consumers, which is increasing because of interactive media, but it also means that human strong and weak points are expressed more clearly. And when we talk about responsible products, it means that on the one hand, awareness increases. I'd rather buy products where I know the whole supply chain products, where I know what the production conditions were, are they ethical or not. But on the other hand, the same consumer will buy low-cost products, cheapest products, where they know full well that it is polluting the environment, that it was produced with child labor. So, to some extent, the markets and consumers are irrational, and the modern technology will amplify this. So, the weak and strong points of consumers will be amplified by this. So, markets reflect very well how rationally or irrationally we behave. Well, perhaps we could pay a certain debt here 
because we were we did say that we would speak very briefly about this project of school uniforms because the students here would like to know how far this project has progressed. Has it been accepted in the schools where these uniforms are being tested and worn? And do you think a possibility of developing this any further in the future? Reno Samin. Perhaps I need to tell you a bit uh, something about the background and the, the history of this. The project came about this way. The pupils were able to select from four designers, and they were all young designers. And then with the one who won, the pupils were able to help this young designer, a woman, to design further the uniforms. So it was a very participatory project. So everything was discussed about individuality, how the brand determines me, and where the young, the young were able to say, I'm not defined by the brand, by Nike, for example, but my name is Marcus or whatever. This is where opinion forming was strengthened. The Adolescents knew that they had to enter into a better dialogue with their teachers if they wanted to be understood. There were many ups and downs. The school children didn't really know how to design or what the uniforms should look like. Should it be more traditional? Should it more be more like a uniform? Or should it be more comprehensive, including the shoes, or should it just be T-shirts and pullovers? But how do these adolescents cope with those of their fellow pupils who do not wear the uniform tested? Well, they're under a lot of pressure, and I'm very surprised by how well they are resisting this pressure. They've been teased endlessly by the others, suddenly they had to cope with being a celebrity. And they, in fact, had wanted to be like a, a model, and now they suddenly realize what it's like when the media lights are on them, when they're in the limelight, when the media then uh, quote them wrongly. So it's been a challenge to them. What would you say about this experience? Would you think that it is a project that should be conducted elsewhere? Well, let me say something about school uniform and school apparel. I think such a project is only sensible if there are flanking measures, if it is also accompanied by discussions about identity brands, how the family copes with it, when the children ask for all sorts of other things to be bought, all this has to be discussed. I think it's also interesting to note the project that has been ongoing for seven years in Hamburg. Then there's the Dickhäuser study on the school uniform project there has only shown positive results. There's a less, more of a feeling of uh, belonging to a community, less distraction during uh, school time, if a project is conducted in such a way, then I would be in favor of it. Well, it's a whole collection of particularities and achievements that you have described. Are there any questions from the audience regarding this project or this experiment? Yes, right at the back, a gentleman would like to say something on this subject. <laughs> Yes, please, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. My name is Arthur Sigletoile from the International School of Geneva, and my question is very short. When are brands harmful to South City? Did you understand the question? I'm sorry, I didn't answer. The question was, when are brands harmful to society? 
Verstanden. Können Sie eine Antwort geben? Could you answer that question, so, so, so Martin? Stellen, please come back with your question again, because we yeah, couldn't no, really think, get the point. I think the question was, when are brands harmful to society? Okay. Right? Is that what you said? <coughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, I think there are easy examples to, uh, we know the examples where that's the case, where there are health issues, um, where there are environmental issues, where there are community issues. Uh, and I think, again, what we've seen in the last few years is that where there are those issues, responsible corporations, and I think corporations are increasingly being forced to behave responsibly by the marketplace, not necessarily by government regulation, that in those cases, corporations take the action to deal with it. They may, they may take the action through better information, uh, education, or whatever, because the, the essential issue, I think, behind the question, it, it sort of was touched on before, is if there are things going wrong in the system, how do you deal with it? Do you do it by educating the consumer to purchase goods and services in a more effective way, or does the government take regulatory action to ban these products and keep them out of consumers grasp. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fundamentally the issue. I think increasingly what you will see, and we, we mentioned uh, you know, labeling more effectively organically grown product. Um, we're going to see big issues coming as, as we see the provision of biotechnology products and services, foods and medicines, where consumers have doubts, and sometimes governments have doubts about the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of them or the, some of the morali mor morality issues that are raised by them. I think increasingly corporations are making decisions on behalf of the consumer that act in an ethical way. So when things do harm the consumer or when brands do have negative values or negative attributes, I think companies increasingly adjust to it because of the pressure from the consumers themselves. And by the way, technology is enabling us to react as consumers much more effectively than we were able to do years ago. David Bossard, ich möchte... David Bossard, would you like to have the last word before I ask two other gentlemen to come up to the podium? One more question from the audience. Could you just stand up and uh, get the microphone and put this last question? And then I'll ask you, David Bossard, how you see the future supplier or manufacturer of a brand and what the features of such a manufacturer would have to be. Your question. Um, I'm Jäger from Winterthur and I'd like to say something about school uniforms. This is being discussed. There are a lot of prejudice about it and there's a lot of opposition against regulations. But if there were to be a vote between Mr. Sami and Mr. Bossart, how would, you, how would you vote? Should it be introduced, these school uniforms, or not? Mr. Bossart? Well, there will be more and more fragmentation, differentiation of markets, and the schools will make use of this to distinguish themselves, set themselves off against others, because in the future, the fiercest competition will be the knowledge competition, and schools will have to sell themselves on the market. They are in competition with one another, which school is going to offer the better knowledge and teaching. So uniforms may become a sign of a certain status that is to be communicated. So these examples will certainly increase. That was your answer. Reno Sami, how would you vote? Well, my very personal opinion is that I would like to see my daughter wear a school uniform. Well, thank you very much for that interesting question and for all the answers. You are the precursors at the GDI, at your institute. How do you see the future suppliers of brands and their responsibilities in the light of this discussion? Do you really want to know? Yes, please. Well, they are under a lot of pressure. They have to learn, but let's not forget and underestimate it. Here we have the CEOs in Davos, and uh, there's a challenge to their social responsibility. There has to be more environmental protection thinking. How can you integrate this in the organization? 
the branded companies are tremendous machineries and to change mentality and the way of thinking in these organizations that have become uh, rigid or, or, or fixed over the decades will take a lot of work. Obviously, we can be optimistic for the Western world and we could give you a positive assessment, but we have no idea what's going to happen in India, in China, in Vietnam, in Brazil simply because these markets, and again, this is a personal opinion, these markets uh, are in very difficult circumstances for market to regulate itself you need well-educated people or people that have a minimum of education and uh, they will have to deal with brands that they have not been acquainted with so far. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Borsart. Uh, we've been discussing at different levels, and that was to be expected. But if we are to learn something that we all have in common from this forum is that every individual, even young consumers, will have much more influence than presently is the case. And you, ladies and gentlemen, will also have much more influence on the products that you will buy or refuse to buy. So thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you for having taken the time and the trouble to come to this panel. I would like to ask Mr. Thomas Wiss and Mr. Andre Schneider, the two co-organizers of this open forum, one on behalf of WEF and the other on behalf of the Swiss Federation of Swiss Protestant Churches to address us very briefly by way of conclusion, and I say goodbye to everyone and look forward to seeing you again at the next Open Forum in Davos in 2008.